Hey everyone, this is Nick and this has been a pretty bad week for open source software. Because this week there's a new proposed European Union law that would basically make open source developers liable for any security issues that there is in the software that they develop, when their current licenses clearly state that the software is provided as is without any warranty. And we also have Google firing a ton of people, including their brightest and most talented open source engineers, which is obviously not great. Oh, and we also have the GNOME 44 Alpha being made available for everyone to test. So let's unpack this segue to today's sponsor. Yes, it came packaged in a box. Thanks to Linode for sponsoring this video. Linode is my favorite solution to run a Linux or gaming server. It's what I use to run my own Nextcloud instance and my own only office server. The interface is super easy to use. They are affordable, they have tons of documentation online, and they have one-click deployable servers for a ton of applications or games, like Pi-hole. Pi-hole is a DNS sinkhole that filters out requests to add serving domains. Basically, it lets you block ads and improve network performance. It lets you actively monitor every DNS request made on your network and block requests as they come in. And you can deploy it in one click on Linode so you can ensure I stay poor. And to get you started, Linode is giving you $100 of free credit to get your own Linux server or gaming server running. To get access to that, just click the link in the description below. I regularly praise the EU for curbing the privacy abuses of various companies, but this time what they have in mind might be a big mistake. The proposed Cyber Resiliency Act, or CRA, is a new legal framework that aims to improve software and hardware security, and it would basically let the EU stamp a CE sign on software products with the simple goals of having a common metric to judge a project's security and better information to consumers on the security status of various pieces of software, probably through some kind of seal of approval delivered by the EU. I would say something akin to nutrition labels, but for secure software. So far, so good, but the main issue is that this legal framework might very well mean open source software is out of bounds and would never be able to get that certification. Open source software is, by nature, provided as is, without warranty or liability for its authors. And these new proposed laws would basically mean that open source developers would, in fact, be liable for their product security when the goal is to provide accessible software that companies can then modify and secure themselves, or contract companies that sell maintenance services around that open source software. Another issue is that this new Cyber Resiliency Act would restrict the use of unfinished software for testing purposes only. And unfinished software is a very vague definition, and it would mean no betas allowed at all. Of course, the Open Source Initiative has submitted feedback to try and make the European Commission reconsider their laws for open source software, giving it an exception so it can keep functioning as an open development community. So let's hope it's just going to be a matter of wording to exclude open source software from the scope of this new regulation. I am not saying that open source software should not be secure or isn't secure, but by its very nature, it's going to be very hard for it to conform to such a high security standard or to comply with the security certification. And if no exclusion is put in place, since virtually all companies make use of some kind of open source software or another on their website, web app, or just pure software product, it's going to kill development innovation in the EU if open source cannot be used reliably by companies that want to propose something that conforms to this security standard. You might have seen that Google laid off 12,000 employees recently, which is bad enough, especially when you consider that some of their investors would like them to slash 20% of their workforce and reduce compensation. But what is worse is that these layoffs seem to affect particularly their open source and Linux teams. Prominent developers that were let go include the founder of Google's open source programs office, basically their whole open source division, as well as the co-creator of Samba and the person recently hired to spearhead Google's open source security initiatives. Layoffs also include 16% of the 400 employees working on Fuchsia, their new kernel plus OS that was once touted as the replacement for Android. 
and that already ships on some Nest devices. The only open source division that seemed relatively unaffected was the one working on AI-related projects. Of course, this happens in a context where Alphabet, Google's parent company, reported revenue for the third quarter of 2022 that was up 6% compared to last year, but profits were down by 16%. And since everyone else in the tech sector is firing people, they had to follow suit to please investors. TCI Fund Management, one of Google's investors, even reported that the most talented and brightest computer scientists at Google were but a fraction of the company's total manpower. But the issue here is that it's not administrative personnel being let go, which would still suck, it's actual engineers working on the backbone of the internet, which as we all know runs on open source. Seeing Google laying off people working on these crucial projects is definitely not a good sign for the direction the company is headed in. So if there still was any doubt, the Google don't be evil era is gone and done and has been for a long while. Now they will only cater to investors and the only thing they care about is AI. It's not a good sign. The GNOME 44 Alpha is now out for testing and it brings a bunch of changes. First, the GNOME web browser is now ported to GTK4, although it is not used all that much by many people, so maybe that doesn't matter. The GTK file picker finally supports a grid view with thumbnails, something that will finally put an end to that old meme that's been around for a decade at least. Nautilus now handles 64 pixels icon sizes in the grid view. The quick settings menu now has a Bluetooth sub menu to pair with devices you've already connected to, something that required an extension previously. You can also disable settings search results in the activity view, and the accessibility settings have been redesigned entirely. On top of that, sharing Wi-Fi passwords using a QR code is now easier, the date and time panel now works better on mobile devices, and the about panel in the settings will show firmware versions as well. You will also be able to set a default calls and SMS app for mobile phones, the display panel will better handle night light errors, and the Thunderbolt panel will only appear if your device actually supports it, which makes sense. A bunch of other settings panels have been touched up, and also the GNOME software store now better supports RPM OS 3, so updates on distributions like Silverblue will be way more legible with progress indicators. You will also be able to hide non-open source applications from the store, and to automatically remove unused Flatpak runtimes so you can save some space. And of course, the various GNOME apps received a bunch of updates, like maps being able to pull Wikipedia thumbnails and article extracts for locations, there's a new service to detect sandboxed apps that are running in the background, the shortcuts portal is implemented, so apps can use keyboard shortcuts even when they're not in focus under Wayland, and Nautilus search should now be faster. On paper, it doesn't really look like a big update to GNOME, but the developers still have until the end of March to finalize all of this and maybe add some new features as well, like the proposed removal of the application name menu that's in the top bar and that currently is kind of useless. Ubuntu made their Ubuntu Pro subscription generally available to everyone after introducing it as a beta in October. It's also not just available commercially for companies, but it's free for individuals on up to five computers. Ubuntu Pro basically gives your Ubuntu release 10 years of support, live patching for the kernel, so you can apply updates without any downtime, plus extended security maintenance, so you can get patches for critical, high and some medium security issues, with the critical patches being delivered under 24 hours. They will also provide support for 2300 open source Debian packages in the Ubuntu main repo for 10 years, and they will support 23,000 packages from the Universe repo for 10 years as well. It is definitely more geared towards servers than desktops, but companies that run Ubuntu desktops for their employees might also want this to ensure their fleet is always secure. And if you, as an individual running Ubuntu on your laptop or desktop, also want these benefits, because you like sticking to LTS releases and you don't want to upgrade all the time, well, all you need is a free Ubuntu One account and you can register up to five machines to get these advantages. Linking your computer to that subscription requires a few command lines, but nothing tricky. I think it's a really good move from Canonical to offer this kind of service. It's very valuable for anyone who has a fleet of servers or desktops, 
but it can also be very useful for enthusiasts that just don't feel like upgrading to every new release that's not an LTS. I will probably use that on my next cloud server which runs Ubuntu. Linux distros are a dime a dozen, but sometimes you get something more than just an Ubuntu derivative with a theme and a few apps. This time it's Blend OS, a distribution that aims to be the last distro you will ever use if you're a distro hopper and you can't decide between Arch, Ubuntu or Fedora. Blend OS is basically Arch with GNOME on Wayland, but it offers the ability to install Ubuntu dev packages and Fedora RPM packages, both in Distrobox and Podman containers, so they don't mess with the rest of your Arch system. You will have to install apt and dnf yourself to make use of this, and you can also install BlendOS's own package manager, called Blend. When you install a package using apt or dnf, the distro will create a container automatically, and you can then use the command lines you're used to without any weird stuff to do, and packages will install where they're supposed to without breaking your system by mixing dependencies. The Blend Package Manager will then be able to update all packages from all package managers in a single command, so you don't have to maintain too many things yourself. Of course, it has access to the AUR as well, and to Flatpak with a Flathub Store app installed, which is basically just a web view of the Flathub website. It also supports immutable file systems if you want to use that, and it lets you install any other desktop environment if you prefer, or even a window manager like i3 or Sway. It's a very interesting concept for people who absolutely want the bleeding edge capabilities of Arch with the latest desktop environments, the latest applications, and basically the latest everything, but also to have access to a simple, stable development environment using Fedora or Ubuntu. Now, we also have a few application updates in GNOME land this week, just like every other week. Tongram, the web browser that lets you keep a bunch of web apps pinned in a single simple window, has been ported to GDK4 and Libadvita, and it now has a responsive UI, plus better web performance, probably thanks to an updated WebKit engine, and also support for the system dark or light theme. Denaro, the personal finance manager formerly called Money, has a new release out with a bunch of new features, like attaching an image of a receipt for transactions, letting you repeat those transactions, exporting an account as a PDF, sorting transactions by ID or date, and some performance improvements as well. Bottles got a new update as well, and they greatly optimized the first startup of the app by downloading necessary components way faster. They also added game scope improvements for running it on the Steam Deck, NV API should work properly now for NVIDIA users, and there are tons of bug fixes, and VKD3D is enabled by default for gaming bottles. And we also got a nice look at GNOME on mobile phones, and it already looks quite functional, being all based on nice easy gestures that should be familiar to everyone using Android or iOS. It was demoed on a OnePlus 6T with post-market OS, and it all feels very fast and fluid. Now there are still some things that need tweaking of course, like the double pull down gesture to show the GNOME quick settings, or the keyboard not always showing up in text fields, but it's already in pretty good shape. Honestly, all it seems to be missing, for me at least, is a simple, easy implementation of WayDroid and maybe Micro-G so I can install the few Android apps I need. If I could find a good phone, good enough, that runs it, I would probably switch. And let's finish this with the gaming news. First, since EA had replaced their Origin launcher by the EA app, a lot of their games stopped working correctly on Linux and on the Steam Deck. Fortunately, it seems like it's being fixed, as Valve went and re-reviewed a bunch of titles to mark them as playable after they delivered a fix in Proton. Newly re-playable titles now include Battlefield 1, 4 and 5, Jedi Fallen Order, the Sims 4, Titanfall 2, A Way Out, It Takes Two, the Mass Effect Legendary Edition, Mass Effect Andromeda, and a lot more. Now, a new year, a new version of Wine, this time version 8.0. This one finally completes the transition of libraries to the PE executable format, which means the road is open for supporting copy protection, 32-bit on 64-bit systems, and more importantly, x86 apps on ARM. A new theme is enabled by default as well, so Windows apps won't look so Windows 95 anymore, and the various graphics drivers for Vulkan and DirectX have been improved a lot, with major performance improvements. MPEG-1 audio decoders are now also implemented, 
and the Media Foundation libraries that let video and audio be played have been improved. Finally, controller hot plug support has received improvements as well, on top of adding support for driving wheels, joysticks, rumble, DualShock and DualSense controllers from the PlayStation, and more. All included apps with Wine now also support theming and high DPI, and there are a lot of improvements to various libraries and services. And of course, Wine 8.0 will probably serve as the base for Proton 8, which means that all these improvements should trickle their way down to us poor Linux gamers that use Steam. And finally, we have a new version of DXVK, the DirectX translation layer used to run games on Linux. This new release adds basic HDR support, but for game scope only for now, so on the Steam Deck or Holo ISO. Shader compilation has also been improved for everyone, so there should be less stutters when loading shaders in a game. And as always, this new version should land in Proton really, really soon, so we can all make use of these performance improvements. It is really a great time to be a Linux gamer. And it is a great time for this segue to today's sponsor. If you're looking for a new computer to run Linux on, stop looking at Windows devices. Buy something that actually supports Linux out of the box. From today's sponsor, Tuxedo. They are based in Germany, but they ship worldwide, and they have a huge range of devices that ship with Linux out of the box. When you buy from them, you know that you can just install your Linux distro and it will run perfectly with perfect support. They have devices for every need and every price point from the most affordable laptops to the higher end workstations, gaming laptops or towers, and you can customize them quite heavily. You can basically spec it out, but you can also replace the keyboard layout with your own custom keyboard layout. You can have your own logo laser etched on the lid of your laptop, and all the laptops that I've tested can be opened up and upgraded with the RAM and the SSD being replaceable. So if you need a new device and you plan to run Linux on it, and you want to support Linux's development, get yourself a Tuxedo device by clicking on the link in the description below. So thanks everyone for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, don't hesitate to like, to subscribe, to turn on notifications, to write a comment. And if you didn't, well, there's that dislike button as always. And if you want to support the channel, there's a super thanks button underneath the video. There's a PayPal link in the description and there are links to my Patreon memberships and YouTube memberships. Both get access to a weekly podcast on Monday and the right to vote on the next topics that I'll cover on the channel. Oh, and also there's a audio podcast version of these Linux news where I cover more topics and I go more in depth. So check them out in the link in the description as well. Thanks for watching and I guess you'll see me in the next one. Bye.